The central banks continue to buy gold, not just like Russia and China, but, you know, what was the most recent, Ireland? Again, they're just diversifying as well. I mean, they're taking their dollar reserves and like, taking some of those dollars and exchanging it for hard asset, gold. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments, Kilo Valcambi Silver Bars, for only two seventy five dollars over spot. 10 ounce Nadir silver bars for only $2.95 over spot. Call us at 1 888 81 Liberty. That's 1 888 815 4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Craig Hemke from TF Metals Report. Craig, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Elijah. Happy New Year. Nice to see you. Happy New Year. And speaking of the New Year, you recently posted your forecast for 2022. Can you kind of walk us through that and what you're expecting for the metals this year? Well, it's it's always kind of a dangerous proposition to crank out these forecasts. Um, I started TF Metals Report about 12 years ago, and I started doing this five or six years ago. And it's, it's always a challenge. Now, there's some years that seem to lay out a little more predictable than others. Um, and then there's some years where it's just like, well, we'll take a stab at this, but this is going to be a crazy year. And I, I fear that this is going to be a real crazy year. Uh, you know, it's an election year again here in the U.S. You got the Fed not knowing, you know, you really don't know what they're going to do. You got geopolitics, you know, where all of a sudden there's all these hot spots flaring up around the world. Um, I, there's all kinds of crazy things are going to happen this year, which make it challenging. But I call it a macro cast because at this point, if you can just get some of the macroeconomic things right, you know, what's going on with inflation, what's going on with the economy, what's the Fed going to do, then you're, you know, you're 70% of the way of getting, getting it right on prices too. So, so we took a stab at it and um, I, 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 I think it aligns a little bit with where we were a couple of years ago. So I ended up being kind of optimistic, but again, this is going to be some kind of year, Elijah, so we'll see how it all plays out. Do you have any price targets for both gold and silver this year? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Um, I mean, that's all part of the fun. Some folks look at me and think, you know, that that's like, you got to aim higher. Okay. And I, I just, I, I never have, um, just because I, I don't think there's any value to, you know, claiming we're going to $10,000 or something like that. I just, I think that scares people away more than anything else. So, uh, you know, over the last 15 years since the great financial crisis, go back to 2007, dollar price gold has averaged about 11%. Okay, that's at least a good place to start. Uh, we finished the year uh, right around 1800. So 11% would get you up just somewhere north of 2000 for the end of the year or a high, you know, high watermark, something like that. That seems, I mean, at least plausible. Silver usually does, you know, about twice as well or twice as poorly as gold. So you can kind of do that math as well. And I and I think, again, if we can get the macro stuff right, and I, the signs are there that this year is a lot like 2010 or even 2019. And those were both really good years for the precious metals. Uh, because it, they were both years where the world, the investment world kind of figured out that the Fed was full of it. And I think that's the revelation that will be had over the course of this year again. I, I might expand on that further, I guess, Elijah. You know, we, in the great financial crisis, we had QE for the first time in March of 2009. And we were assured by the Ben Bernanke, as we used to call him, that it was a one-time deal, right? It was just in response to the financial crisis. And eventually the Fed would draw its balance sheet back down to a trillion dollars. And the rates would go to normalize and all that kind of stuff. And in 2010, you know, uh, as the year began, uh, the markets kind of believed him. Problem was by November of 2010, we got QE2. <laughs> and that was when, you know, silver about, I don't know, moved up 150%. Gold over time moved up nearly 100% and hit what had then been an all-time high north of 1900. And, uh, you know, again, there was this glimpse behind the curtain that 
hey, wait a second, the Fed's just kind of tugging our chain here. Nothing, they're not going back. Okay, so then fast forward to 2018 into 19, we'd had five years of the Fed telling us that rates are going to go up and they were normalized the balance sheet and all that kind of stuff. And then the markets broke and the stock market crashed about 20% in 20 days in December of 18. And so Fed changed policy again. They started cutting rates by June of 19, where as 19 began, I, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan said they were going to be hiking rates four times. Does that sound familiar? by the way. Um, so anyway, again, you, it gets revealed that the Fed, they can't, they're no going back to, you know, trimming the balance sheet in half and all that kind of stuff not happening. So if we're in this period again, Elijah, where people are realizing that the Fed is full of it, then we're probably on the cusp of another pretty significant move. Again, it was big move in 2010 and 11, another really big move out of 18 into the middle part of 2020. Yeah, we conceivably could be on the doorstep of that again. We just got word of the 7% inflation rate for the month of December, year over year inflation. Um, so this is the highest, even higher inflation, and it just keeps going up. I was just interviewing Steve Penny, and he was saying how it seems like whenever we've got these inflation numbers, you know, last year, uh, what happened to the markets is... They didn't react very, um, it wasn't like the markets were afraid of this high inflation because, you know, they thought the Fed was going to um, taper and respond to this and get inflation under control. But the interesting thing is what we saw yesterday when that inflation number came out, we had precious metals jump. Um, and he thought this was very encouraging that that whole narrative of the Fed is going to get this under control, that has shattered. And now we're we're in a whole different ballgame, your perspective. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, again, everybody was convinced last year the transitory nature of all this, right? So not only was inflation supposedly just to be a couple month phenomenon that was going to go away, but so were the negative real interest rates, inflation adjusted interest rates. And negative real interest rates are the most strongly correlated thing with gold prices that we have. You know, as real rates go negative, where your inflation rate is higher than your interest rate, that augurs, well, why not own gold then, right? At least keep up with inflation. You don't get a dividend, but it's better than, you know, going backward. And so there's that broke, though. That correlation really failed. I failed me with my 2021 forecast because I saw this coming and I thought gold would go up. But instead, all these market participants, the hedge funds, the institutions that buy the gold futures, they bought it. So again, is it part of that revealing, you know, the guy behind the curtain is not the great wizard uh, and that he's been, you know, spinning yarns and telling you lies as part of that reveal, you get this idea that, OK, maybe it is, you know, more permanent. And mathematically, from an economic perspective, that's that's the case, because Elijah, I mean, I, I know you know this, but I mean, it, it, the base cause of inflation is too many do dollars chasing too few goods. So we have all these dollars that have been created. You know, M2 money supply was up whatever it was, 40% last year. And then you've got not only a static supply of goods, you've got a declining supply of goods with the supply chain issues and all that stuff. Okay, so how are you going to solve that? You're going to either get more goods or they're going to be less dollars. And I'm not sure you're getting either of those. In fact, I mean, the last nine months, real wages, not real interest rates, but real wages where, you know, your wages might go up 4%, but inflation goes up 8 you're actually losing 4% of your purchasing power, 4% of your quality of life, your standard of living. So real wages have been falling. Well, what if, and you know, with the great, what do they call it? The great quit or the great resignation, all that kind of stuff. If that continues. Re what other tools do employers have besides higher wages and yeah, benefits, I guess, stuff like that. But wages eventually rise to get people to come to work. And so, you get this, you know, in economics back like in the 70s and 80s, they're always worried about what they call a wage price spiral, right? More wages lead to higher prices, lead people needing more wages. I'm not sure if we're there yet, but it definitely uh, makes the argument that these inflation that inflation is getting entrenched. And and then okay, wait a second, if inflation is entrenched, then inflation expectations become entrenched. The Fed has always admitted 
it takes at least six to nine months for any policy change of theirs to have any impact. So now if they don't do anything till March. We're talking Christmas next year before Fed policy has any impact on inflation. Now all of a sudden that's entrenched. And inflation expectations get more sticky. And now all of a sudden real interest rates being negative, that idea gets more sticky. And all of a sudden you get people starting to want more exposure to gold through any way they can get it. And so that's, I think, a little bit what Steve was mentioning there. And and again, maybe we're starting to see that already. And when it comes to inflation being entrenched, I mean, if we're looking at a year at least, you know, of 7% inflation, I mean, how is that going to impact the standard of living for people? You know, we're seeing prices go up across the board and a lot of people think it's even higher than 7%. But even if you go by that number, it seems like not a pretty situation. Right, right. You see, that's the thing. Um, what I guess gets lost sometimes is that the inflation, the numbers go up, but they don't then go back down. It's not like, say you had something that was cost you $5 a year ago, and it went up 20% in price this year. It's now all of a sudden it's $6. Well, if now in 2022, it's only going to go up 10% in price, that's still six dollars and sixty cents versus five fifty. It's not like you reset down to five and then you know add ten percent again. So I mean, this is a legitimate, serious problem, especially on that uh, for real wages for the you know the great you know ninety percent of the people in the U.S. that live and work and pay their bills and try to you know raise their families and all that kind of stuff. So this is this is going to it is a problem. It's going to stay a problem. I saw some stuff, you know, as we record this here on the 13th, the producer price index came out and month over month, it was only 0.2 percent down from 0.7 or 8. And I saw people go, hey, isn't that great. See, it's already working. The Fed just has to talk about it. Um, it was 0.2 percent because energy prices fell in December uh, barrel of crude oil went from 85 to 65. A lot of that crash came, went down $10 on Black Friday, right? Last Friday of November after Thanksgiving. So energy prices, as they factored into the PPI, were sharply lower from November and December. But I mean, I, I don't know if people have noticed, but I mean, we're right back to 82 in crude. So that factor being, you know, uh, that's only going to go back up when we get, you know, the next CPI and PPI next month. And again, that's all about this getting entrenched, you know, part of the the equation going forward. So I, I don't know, I, you know, the, the Fed certainly can't afford higher interest rates. So no one can, the government can't, the consumer can't, the states can't, the cities can't, you know, pension funds that have, that are loaded with bonds and insurance companies are loaded with bonds, higher interest rates mean they'd have to mark their portfolios to market with falling bond prices. Nobody can afford it. And, and so there, we were in the real risk of, as we go through the year, higher short-term rates, but falling long-term rates, inverting the yield curve and driving ourselves if we're not already heading that way, toward recession. And then you got talking stagflation, like we had back in the 70s. And, and you know, that's not something that nobody wants to go there. So I, a lot in play. No doubt about that, my friend. That's all part of why, like I said, I'll, I'll make my predictions because that's what I do. But this is a toughie. This is going to be some kind of crazy year. And I think that's key because if we look at a very uncertain year, I mean, precious metals have held value for 6,000 years, right? So it's like, regardless of what happens this year, you know, if you're invest in precious metals, if you have some exposure, the precious metals are going to have value by the end of the year, regardless of what happens in other sectors. Right. And value is that key word, I think, Elijah, because we always get focused on price. Everybody does. You're kind of conditioned that way, you know, whether it's stocks or, or your house or, you know, a tool you have or anything. We talk about the price all the time. Yeah, like I just spent, we spent 15 minutes talking about price, but value. Yeah, yeah, because you might see, you know, on a bad day, the price of gold go down $25. But as the plates just continue to spin faster and faster and, you know, everything's just going, you know, closer and closer to the mathematical end, uh, the value of the precious metal doesn't really matter on a day-to-day -day basis. This is always going up. 
you know, for what you want it to do as a part of a, you know, total portfolio, you know, um, yeah, it's irreplaceable. And so, you know, that's like what we try to do at my side. It's not so much about uh, trading and, you know, catching a swing and a pivot and all that kind of jazz. It's more about getting the general trend. And, you know, if you like to buy t even 20 ounces of silver every month, well, you know, if we get the trend right and I, you hold off and you can save you a dollar, yeah, it saves you 20 bucks more than pays for your subscription. I mean, the main thing is just the recognition of where we are, how fast we're getting there, and then taking preparatory steps, you know, ahead of these events that are definitely coming just a matter of when, you know, when they get here. And I think one of the things is also that with paper assets, you know, like stocks and bonds and all of that, is if we look back at the 2008 crisis, we saw those fall significantly, yes, but also some people, you know, got locked out of their accounts and stuff like that and banks went under. And it's like when you have physical precious metals, you know, you have that regardless of other financial institutions, how they play out and stocks and bonds can can go to zero. So but physical precious metals can't. And I think that's very key. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and if if there are people that are out there and there are a lot of them that are frustrated with price and the pricing scheme and how can trading of a futures contract be the determinant thing for price? It doesn't make any sense. You know, ever since Nixon suspended the convertibility of the dollar into gold because there wasn't enough gold to go around, the financial system has developed, you know, all sorts of gold substitutes. Synthetic gold, you know, pretend gold, whatever you want to call it, whether it's futures contracts or ETFs, uh, unallocated accounts, you know, where they, they claim they have the metal, but they don't charge you a storage fee. But on where they do have metal, they do charge you a storage fee. I'm always amazed at how that works out. But anyway, um, if you're frustrated by price and you'd like to see, uh, you know, what actually happens in a physical market, uh, like the best thing you can do is own physical metal. Don't own the different things that are just simply an exposure to price. Buy the real thing. You know, every hand that we take out of the financial system, the bank, you know, driven system, and get it in your own hands or, you know, whatever, trusted storage company, then that kind of speeds along the process, getting closer to a true price discovery of, you know, based on how many, how many dollars is it going to take for me to get my hands on that ounce? You know, as opposed to, well, I can buy this ETF or I can, you know, buy a futures contract or whatever. So, yeah, there's definitely still a time and a place. And this is the time and this is the place to have physical metal. And um, yeah, it's not ever anything, you know, nobody should ever sink everything into one asset class. That, I mean, nobody, I mean, that'd be foolish, right? You wouldn't put it all in Tesla, right? You might have some allocation to Tesla just to kind of, for the whole blended portfolio. But boy, you look around a year like this, like I said, you've got a risk of money. Who knows what the monetary policy is going to be? we got political risk, uh, you know, ahead of that next U.S. election. I mean, think back what it was like in the summer of 2020. I mean, what's it going to be like in the summer of 2022? Um, we'll see. And then you got geopolitics, whether it's China and Taiwan or Russia and NATO or Iran and Saudi Arabia. I mean, I... But all of it, just, you know, if you have some gold and silver where the value is always there, makes you feel, it makes you sleep a little better at night. You mentioned really a way, that's a way that people can uh, vote with their wallet, right, for this um, getting money outside of the system. We saw a lot of people doing that this year, especially at the, or last year, especially at the beginning of the year with the silver squeeze. Do you see that happening again where really retail investors have some impact on the price of silver be fun to do wouldn't it i mean I was, I was right there last year when that idea first took hold on that last friday of january and that was that was fun and and those i mean that group over there that wall street silver group is just it's only growing i mean it's just getting to be more and more people so we'll see um i you know it, it, there's kind of that awakening you got to reach a point of critical mass where enough people demand physical metal right more than the system can provide. I'm not sure if we're there yet, but I just even on an individual basis. So Elijah, um, if, if someone were to skim around, you know, on Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever, it's just start typing in, you know, central banks buying gold. And just even as of late, 
the, the central banks continue to buy gold, not just like Russia and China, but, you know, I don't know what was the most recent? Ireland. OK. And the central banks realize that, again, they're just diversifying as well. I mean, they're taking their dollar reserves and like, taking some of those dollars and exchanging it for hard asset gold. Well, okay, how'd they get dollar reserves? Well, from, you know, build up of trade, foreign currency reserves and stuff. Well, you and I have dollar reserves, Elijah. I mean, it's called a bank account. You know, it's your savings account. It's your account at Ameritrade or Schwab or something. Those are your dollar reserves. You you went out and worked. You spent some of what you made. You paid taxes. Whatever's left over is your savings. Those are your dollar reserves. Well, if these central banks in preparation of, you know, where this is ultimately headed, if they want to diversify some out of dollars into gold, well, geez, Louise, why wouldn't, why wouldn't we as individuals do the same? So we just keep trying to put that message out there, grow the amount of people that are seeking physical metal. And then, you know, if, if in the off chance we can demand enough that it stresses the system and again, pulls back that curtain so that people realize that there's far much, far more pretend metal than there is the actual thing. Um, that could be a real fun event to be a part of as well. I know. Yeah. Like becoming your own central bank, I think is so key. I don't remember who originally came up with that phrase. I know Gregory Manorino talks about it a lot, but yeah, really taking charge. We do live in a fiat monetary system that, you know, seems very fraudulent in, in some respect, a system that is all based on just digits on a screen, just paper, not really having any fundamental worth, but, you can take charge and become your own central bank and hold physical metal yourself. So I think that's so key. And I guess before we let you go, Craig, any last thoughts before we let you go and where can our viewers find you online? Well, uh, last thoughts would be just, you know, try to focus on the big picture this year. Cause there's going to be, you know, the news just comes at you so fast, you know, day to day. And it's so easy to get distracted. Um, th there's never been a more important time for critical thinking, independent thinking and doing your own homework, uh, because so much of what comes at you is biased or some type of agenda, uh, or repeated by people that don't know what even remotely what they're talking about, but it's just a talking point and they're out with some political agenda or something else. So it's all about educating yourself. Um, I, you know, we play a small part in that. For our subscribers at TF Metals Report, um, I do what I do, which is, you know, writing and talking about it every day. But the, the, the big value of my site is that everybody else is on it and the links that they provide and the perspective they provide from their part of the world. Because I got people from all over the globe, people working together, you know, they're private messaging each other, you know, helping each other out. Uh, with questions or anything else. And so, uh, I, you know, if anything, in a year like this, I mean, it's 15 bucks a month, but I think it's money well spent just to uh, give you as many sources of objective information as you can get. And again, it's all right there, tfmetalsreport.com. Fantastic. Craig, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Always good to see you, Elijah. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin, satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs.